Welcome back to the Line Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander, and this is a place that we bring together the world's leading experts in all things health and wellness to help you optimize your mind, your body, your movement, and all things. Today's episode is quite different. I was contemplating not actually releasing this because I wasn't sure if it would be appropriate for uh, the genre of this podcast. It is about, uh, it's from a really sweet wonderful human being called Sierra Lynch, and uh, she is known as the Humiliatrix. I learned about her, her through a friend called Chris Ryan, who you know from this podcast. He's been here two or three times. I uh, wrote Sex at Dawn, a recent book with Civilized to Death, and uh, really fantastic human being uh, and really interesting work, line of work that she's in. She professionally humiliates men much like a dominatrix would, uh, she instead of dominating them, she humiliates them. So there is a whole market of individuals out there that uh, crave humiliation, and she provides that service. And so I thought it'd be interesting to share a conversation and uh, see what that's all about. What is her experience working with people? Uh, why does she do that? Why do people respond to that in the first place? So, uh, like I said, I wasn't sure if I was going to release this, but we are going to do it. And uh, I hope you enjoy. If your kids are around, maybe this would be one to hold off. Maybe have them listen to the Kelly Starr episode or the Perry Nicholson instead. If you have been enjoying this podcast, I greatly appreciate reviews on iTunes or Spotify. You can do it right from your phone. You can do it right now. Just go in there, press the little star button. It takes, I think, 15 seconds or so. That is super supportive. And if you're interested in learning more about how to operate your body, how to operate your hips effectively, if you're having low back pain, shoulder pain, uh, shoulder impingement, uh, your eyes are feeling a little stressed out from looking at your phone too much, you have options. One, the Align Method book has all the, the stuff that you would need to remedy those issues. Uh, two, if you want to go deeper than that, you can check out the Align Method on Align program, which can be found at alignpodcast.com. Uh, you can also find that in the bio on Instagram at Align Podcast. Uh, here we go. Back to the program with Sierra Lynch. Pow. How do you feel after your cold thermogenesis and all the random shit that we just did? <laughs> I feel pretty good. All right. Yeah. My uh, my roommate always, well, he sometimes does like cold showers and he always talks about how that like wakes him up in the morning. Um so I, I get that. I feel much more alert now. How the hell do you describe what you do for a living? So I think the best word to describe it is humiliatrix. Right. Yes. Of course. Um, so I'm like a dominatrix, but um, instead of a dungeon, I use the internet. Mm. So I basically humiliate men with my words. And I do that over live cam and videos so all my videos are point of view so it's just me and the camera and i'm talking directly to the camera so that when the viewer watches it he feels like i'm talking directly to him yeah and yeah it's it's all under the umbrella of female domination so i'm always like in control and from there there's other little niche fetishes that i touch on so you know like a lot of guys like feet or maybe like cuckolding financial domination what do you call it cuckolding cuckolding i don't know what that is have you ever heard the term cuck? Yeah, isn't that like liberal men? <laughs> right. It's kind of I'm turned, a cuck. Yeah, it's turned into that. <laughs> yeah. It's turned into like this silly <laughs> yeah, insult. That's you, Aaron. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> I do videos for you. <laughs> Perfect. So the origin of the word cuckold is basically a man who is who uh oh, his wife is cheating on him. So oh, right. yeah. And so he, he's not masculine enough to like Right. Maintain a woman. Right. So a guy who has a cuckolding fetish, he kind of gets off on the humiliation of his partner, like fucking other men that are bigger and stronger and better and that sort of thing. And he feels kind of pathetic by comparison. Right. Yeah. How the heck did you get into such a thing? So I got into it when I was, I was living as an exchange student in Japan when I was 17. And when I went there, I didn't know the language at all. And my host families didn't know English. So as you can imagine, I was like really lonely. Um, and how I basically alleviated that. It was just, I was online all the time. I was talking to friends, talking to random people, just, you know, it was just like nice just to talk to someone in English. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> and um, one day this guy saw my picture on some social networking site that was popular at the time. And he thought I was really attractive. And so he started messaging me. And he had a fetish for getting peed on and a fetish for pantyhose. And he just wanted to, like, tell me about it and stuff. And I was just really intrigued by it. And so, I was, you know, I was young. I knew, like, fetishes existed. I've always been, like, a big fan of Dan Savage. And I always read his column when I was, like, really young. And so I knew there were, like, guys that were into, like, kind of weird, interesting things. And women as well. But I feel guys more so. Um so yeah, so I was intrigued and he tried for a long time to get me to meet him and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. And so he, uh, he's like, all right, he kind of got over it and he's like, I know you'll never meet me, but I really think that your piss should be bottled and sold. And so I was like, okay, then buy it. And I didn't really think he was serious. Like I thought it was just like dirty talk. And um, yeah, it turned out he was serious and we like negotiated a price and I sent him a 12 ounce bottle of my urine. He was an American guy who lived in New York, and I shipped it to him, and then two weeks later, I got $250 in the mail. So that was like my light bulb moment. That's kind of what ignited my whole career, and from there- You were 17. Yeah, I was 17. Mm. And so I was like, okay, well, this guy found me by accident. Like, what would happen if I went looking for guys like this? And so I did some research, and I found a website called eBand. And it was like an auction site like eBay, but it was girls selling like their used panties and socks and that sort of thing. So I started selling off of there and I made some good money. And from there, I well, like I always looked at what other girls were doing. And that's how I figured out how to uh, set up my own phone lines. There's like websites you can kind of make a profile and you'd give them uh, your number and they'd set up like a different, you know, like an 800 number and guys could call and, you know, I'd get paid per minute. So, you know, essentially phone sex, but because I came into the industry in this kind of niche fetishy way, all the guys that wanted to talk to me um, were just submissive and like just wanted me to berate them and humiliate them and that sort of thing. And so uh, I did that and... Well, I still do that. And then from there, I start making videos, webcam, and then here I am today. What do you think of the, your clients? I would say at first, I didn't think very highly of them. I just thought they were just kind of these like pathetic, gross individuals. You called them toilets in your video. Toilets, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> toilets of human beings. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's hard not to maybe think less of someone that wants to be, you know, that wants to be called that too. It's different. Yeah. Right. Um, They're into it. Oh, right. Good point. Totally. But yeah, no, at the time I was just kind of young and I just thought they were pathetic and gross, like genuinely. Um, but you know, I've been doing it long enough and I've talked to like some guys will, you know, talk to me more than others and I've gotten to know a few of them and, um, yeah, I don't know. I just kind of got to a point where I realized, like, this is just people. Like, there's no real... People often ask me, like, what type of guy talks to me, and there's, like, no type. Like, mm. there's young, old, rich, poor, all races, everything. So you don't think you'd be able to pick out of a lineup of 100 people? With what accuracy do you think you could find people that would be into being humiliated? Like, just by looking at them? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I have any idea. No way. No. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's all sorts of people. What do you think it says about a person, that, like psychologically, that that turns them on, that that like flips their switch? I don't know if it says anything about them. Like, the, there's no, from what I've read, there's no um, good research or anything into why people develop kinks or why they like what they like. It doesn't, I don't know. It's, it's almost like huh. this kind of weird separate alter ego one has it doesn't really correlate to their personality necessarily. So I don't know. Someone could maybe genuinely be kind of a loser or whatever, maybe haven't done much in life and probably their fetish feeds off of that a little bit. But they're certainly, you know... It's almost like empowering. Like I think that's where some certain kinks may potentially... I know nothing about this, but no. um, someone that maybe was abused at one point, mm -hmm. it would make sense to me, and I've heard this, um, mm -hmm. that them being able to take control of that abuse right and be like oh now i'm it's like no i like it mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like it, it gives them power over it totally. as opposed to it being this thing that they they weren't able to control it's like turning lemons into bonerade yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah i think yeah i think that's totally 
possibility. And I'm sure a lot of fetishes do come from trauma. I don't know that they necessarily do, but I, w- I wish I knew more about it, but there's really just not a lot of research on why people like what they like. So, What have you found is like the buttons? What works the best? I'm sure you've seen like, oh, that wasn't as good as that, and et cetera, mm. et cetera. Well, it depends on the fetish. So a lot, I mean, when you first kind of get into this line of work, like a lot of the fetishes just seem so random and strange. Huh. But when you do it long enough, you notice certain patterns and you kind of realize that people have like a, like almost a template. Like if, if some guy calls me and he says, for instance, like, oh, I'm a sissy. Um, I know that that means I could probably, you know, talk about how he's not a real man or that his penis is really small or that, you know, he wants to suck dick or he, you know, likes to wear frilly panties and stuff like that. So you kind of see these little templates that emerge. And um, if you do it long enough, you can get just like a little bit of information and kind of extrapolate from there and turn it into a whole session. How long would a conversation go? How would one conversation go? How long? Oh, how long? And sure, how would one go as well? <laughs> I'm so curious. Yeah. Uh, I need to hire you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> For what? I don't know. <laughs> I just want to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, typically, like, 10 minutes is pretty standard. Oh, it's short. Yeah. Are they actually, jerking well, off? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I would hope so. <laughs> I'd be super confused if they were. It's like, what are we doing? <laughs> I just want me, do you want me to make you feel bad? That's <gasps> what it. do they say when they're done? Like, okay, oh, they usually thank just, you. Thank you very much. That was great. Yeah, maybe a thank you usually just hangs up. <laughs> oh, <clicks off. laughs> do you ever feel abandoned after that? No, <laughs> you know it's funny you say that. I thought we had a real connection. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually funny you say that because I so I do everything online. I don't meet people in person or anything, but I do have friends. Like one of my girlfriends, she's a real dominatrix. She does like in person sessions and stuff like that, and she never really got into the online thing as much. And she decided she's like, she wanted to start doing cam. And <laughs> she was, you know, she'd do these like little cam sessions. And then she was shocked that they would just like hang up on her after they came. Like, that's how she felt. She's like, I thought we had a thing going. <laughs> like, right. what is this? And I'm the opposite. Like, if a guy doesn't hang up after he comes, I'm just like, what What are we doing? Like, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know what to say after that. Cause how, I know, do you, how do you start the conversation? Mm, I usually ask them like what they're into. That's, you know, I got to, I got to go with that. Um, and hopefully they tell me like what their fetishes are. The worst thing is if a guy's just like, I want to be dominated when it's like, that can mean so many things. So I just usually ask them what they're into. And so how do you lure if they, if they have a, a general response like that, what's your next question? Well, I'll try and get, just ask them to be more specific or I'll ask them like what they think about when they jerk off, like kind of, you know, set the scene for me a little bit. What has surprised you? What has surprised me? Oh, gosh. People are so strange. <laughs> I feel like nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have this one guy. Oh, God. He's he's interesting. He still contacts me on Skype once in a while. Oh, good. This is a really elaborate fantasy. So, mm. first of all, he has a fetish for... It's called Giant Tess. And the fetish is you are attracted to giant women. Not like fat women, but like... 50 foot attack of the 50 foot woman type giant you know Mm. and so usually it's like they have a fantasy of just a giant woman like crushing them or eating them or swallowing them or just kind of playing with them in their hands Mm. and so how i usually do that is i'll just take my webcam put it on the ground and kind of angle it so it's like looking up from my feet so that angle kind of you know makes me look like a giant um tricks of the trade yeah (laughs) (laughs) This is a free podcast, ladies and gentlemen. Good. You're yeah, welcome. This is true. That's worth the price of admission right there. That was legit. So so that, you know, alone, if you've never heard that fetish, might seem a little crazy. But in my world, it's like, okay, you're like giant Tess. But it goes on from there with he wants me to pretend to be his mom. Now, incest fantasies are pretty popular, but most guys or girls that are into it, like they're usually getting off on the idea of like your mom or your dad or your sister, like not your actual relative, you know, it's Mm. more just like kind of the abstract taboo. But this guy actually wanted me to pretend to be his mom so much so that he wanted me to say her name. So I was talking in this awkward way where I was like, you know, Martha Smith is really mad at you. And I was Martha Smith. (laughs) So he kept on wanting to hear his mom's name. 
So it was always a scenario where I was mad at him and I was punishing him by shrinking him. We'll assume that's not actually her name. Yes, no. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I don't think you should. (laughs) Martha's listening. (laughs) She's a huge Allied Podcast fan. There's a lot of Martha Smiths in the world. (laughs) They're like, shit. Oh, yeah, that's good. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm his mom. I'm Martha. I'm mad at him. And I shrunk him down. And then he had a fetish for the backs of my knees. So Mm. I would punish him by picking him up and making him worship the backs of my knees. They're highly erogenous areas, backs of knees as well. Oh, really? Yeah. That makes sense. It's kind of sensitive to the touch. Sensitive area. Yeah. Yeah. But I never, like, it just as a visual body part. It's kind of odd. Yeah. uh, Every body part's pretty weird. That's true. If you really think about it. Yeah. Is there any part that's any more or less weird than another one? No, that's true. But of course, you know, most guys like boobs or butts or something. Boobs so are great. It's, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's just a scenario where I'm mad at him, I shrink him down, and then I pick him up and I make him worship the backs of my knees. And then, oh, and he also wants to involve his dad into it. So he often asks if I live with a man or like a boyfriend or something. And I'm like, no. He's like, okay, well, can you just pretend my dad is there, but like off screen? Wow. So I have to like, I keep on having to like kind of look off screen and be like... Hey, Keith, our son really fucked up. <laughs> so I'm like constantly saying his parents' name, even though I am the mom. So strange. Well, you're like very nurturing. Uh, am I? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is it? I think so. <laughs> to be able to to adapt yourself to that and be like willing to, you know, fit to go that. There. I'm sure it would relate. Do you feel like you're like nurturing outside of your, your dominatrixing? Mm-hmm. Or fe- what do you call it? Um, uh, what, what is it? Uh, maybe just humili- doming. Humiliatrixing. <laughs> That's I can't a hard say word. it. Shit. It's a mouthful. Humiliatrixing. I could say that. It's a mouthful. Did you make that up? Humiliatrix, no. Oh. No. It's not a very common word, but I didn't make it up. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't see myself as a particularly nurturing person. I don't think I'm a sociopath, <laughs> but like. <laughs> but, what um, have you learned that you from your work of the last 15 years that you've mm-hmm. been able to apply into common life? Mm, apply into common life. Um, probably just uh, to be not unjudgmental of totally. what people are into. Like, especially because just nothing surprises me anymore. And so um, it's kind of interesting because a lot of people feel very comfortable, like, opening up and telling me the things they're into, like, even if I don't know them that well. So that's pretty cool. Like, it's nice Mm -hmm. that people, like, trust me even if I don't know them that much. Um, And it's because, you know, nothing really phases me. And so So that's cool. I've become a lot less judgmental. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. Having it seems like a really amazing opportunity to remove bias and filter and mm-hmm. judgment and all that. Yeah, like the reality, everything is weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if you just think about just missionary sex, it's, it's kind of odd. Yeah, it's fucking strange. <laughs> strange. I was like asexual for a while. Oh, really? I was like, I don't get it. Sex, it's like How people long? and. I don't know. I mean, I, w- I wouldn't really call it like properly asexual, but I was just like, I was like m- mute from that. I just wasn't, I found human existence very strange. Mm-hmm. I was like in high school, I was like suicidal for a little bit. Not like I was, it wasn't actually going to happen, but I was mm-hmm. kind of just, I felt like I lost like the, the joie de vivre of life or whatever. I saw everything as just being like these like chemistry beakers of mm-hmm. neurotransmitters and mm-hmm. shit. And if I was ever happy, mm-hmm. I felt like, oh, this is just like serotonin and like all this. Yeah. So it was like almost like this disassociated feeling. Yeah, yeah. And then sexuality, I started to find kind of gross. Huh. How long did that last? Probably, I don't know, maybe maybe a few years or something like that. Oh, wow. I and when you're in high school too. That should be when you're like most randy. Yeah. I found high school to be very strange. Hmm. Yeah. The whole idea of like dating and whatnot. I'm like, I'm a fucking kid. <laughs> I don't have a car. I live with my mom. Yeah. Like, what are we doing? Uh-huh. How could you be attracted to this? Poor <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thing. So, ha- bring it back, though. Did it? Ju- did you just kind of? <laughs> did you just grow out of that? Or I think so. Mm. I don't know. Mm. I'm slowly sorting it Nothing, out. Nothing like happened where you. No, I don't think. No, I don't. I don't think. I moved mm. to Hawaii. And, you know, got more sun. <laughs> got some vitamin, <laughs> vitamin D. I think vitamin D <laughs> sorted me out. <laughs> nice. What do you see for your future? Um, that's a good question. I don't know what I'm going to do after this. I don't think you could be like a grandma and do this. Yeah. I mean, you could. There'd yeah. probably be a lot of guys into it. <laughs> <laughs> you hold another demographic. 
Yes, that's true. Uh, I think my audience is probably <laughs> as big as it's going to be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I've never really been too sure. I've always just tried to be really smart with my money and like save it and invest it and stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of eased the anxiety of like, fuck, what am I going to, you know, because I've always been really conscious of the fact that I can't do it forever. Mm. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I've, you know, kind of thought about going back to school, but I think that's a waste of time. Yeah. I guess depending on what, what you're you going to study? study. Well, I have a bachelor's in psychology, um, which is pretty useless. <laughs> oh, wow, you're a psychologist. Are you kidding me? Well, I'm just a, just a bachelor's though. But whatever. You're like a proper, I mean, you've been working in the, in the barracks. You're like, you're it's like true. in the, in the deep, yeah. deep in there. Yeah. So I don't know if I would pursue that. Maybe get into, I'll get a master's in do counseling or something like that, or maybe something else entirely. You can counsel the guys that you're working with. There you go. <laughs> I, I break them and then I put them <laughs> back together. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> just a just never ending cycle. It's yeah, like absolutely. forever customer. <laughs> yeah. That's like if you're like a jujitsu instructor and a massage therapist. Yeah. There you, you like go. Break their elbows and be like, okay, <laughs> no, after class, they'll sort you out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I've been mostly um, just trying to pursue things that are interesting to me. Um, so like I, I started a podcast earlier this year and I've really enjoyed doing that and really like to start getting into more volunteer work. You know, I think a lot more about doing things that are more meaningful because, um, I like my job. It's very lucrative. I'm very thankful for it, but, um, you know, it doesn't like fill my soul or anything. So, hmm kind of in the process of exploring that right now do you have ever existential crises of like what the hell am i doing with my life even though i'm obviously financially doing fine yeah i had a really weird uh crisis a couple years ago um because i i had this goal in mind that i wanted to pay off my house um on yeah. my 30th birthday and I, you know, I, I kind of did the math and figured out like how much money it would take and so like every month i was just like pumping money into my house and then my 30th birthday came around and I paid it off and I always imagined the day I did that I would just be like elated just like so right. proud and just like oh ah I could just coast now and uh and that didn't happen at all it actually freaked me the fuck out because it was actually a feeling of shit well now what it was a false summit yeah you are like oh fuck yeah it's not what I was expecting at all yeah no, it's much worse <laughs> well it really taught me a lot about goals and like how People really think of meeting your goals as like the finish line. And as long as you're still living, there's no finish line. You know, you got to keep working towards something. So, yeah, that was that was a really interesting lesson. So, yeah, I had a little freak out for, for a few months about that. Um, and uh, kind of went away. I've relaxed since then. But, yeah, I've, I have been thinking about things I want to pursue. Did you put a new goal in place? No, another summit? Um, a little bit. Like I started expanding. Um, like I have a, a rental property and I built another little house on there as well. And so I'll have like these like little financial goals that I'll set for myself, which are which I do enjoy like pursuing. Um, but I need to I need to figure something else out because I know that feeling of when I reach it is like fuck. <laughs> now what? <laughs> I feel like the solution to that is just a sensation. I mean, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about with this, but I th I think just. The, f the sensation that you're helping people, mm -hmm. you know, it's like money. Once you get to a certain point with money, like that you're supported, you're fine. Right. Um, it, it really just becomes paper, mm -hmm. you know? And so, but, but that sensation of feeling like, oh yeah, like other people's lives are better because of whatever, whatever the heck. I, I feel like to me in my experience, that's quite fulfilling. Yeah. I think that's a pretty common um, progression when you when you get to a place where you're like secure in that way then you're most people like naturally want to start helping others yeah what would that potentially look like for you i'm really curious about um volunteering with the elderly or maybe like hospice type hmm. care because i figure you know i'm going that direction so <laughs> yeah, right. i don't spend much time with old people i don't i haven't had much experience with like people i know dying or anything like that so yeah i'd like to start doing something what are your friends like? Are your friends like porn industry people? Are oh, you a lot of them are, yeah. Are you a porn star? <laughs> 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 is uh, that what your title is? Um, I don't even know if you do porn. No. Well, I mean, technically, but I there's guess. no sex. I don't even get naked in my videos, so Yeah. <laughs> I was doing research and I was like, 
I was like, my expectations were far different than what I was actually yeah. getting myself into. I was well, like, oh. All right. It's this certainly. is just interesting. Yeah. Well, it's certainly adult <laughs> content, you know. Like it's certainly it's, adult content. It, it yeah. serves the same purpose as porn, but it's not quite the right. You have naked people around you sometimes. Mm, no. Pretty sure. Do I? I think so. Like women or men? Women. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've I've worked with other girls that do get naked. So. What are your friends like? Uh, most of my friends are in the industry. Um, those friends are kind of spread out though, like around the U.S. and so I. Only see them every so often, but locally, um, let's see, what are my friends like? One of my closest friends um, is this girl that lives pretty close to me, and um, yeah, she's she's pretty normal. I, I hang out with her and her boyfriend a lot, and we play Magic the Gathering, <laughs> and um, <laughs> watch uh, X-Files. <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would have guessed. So it's good. It keeps me grounded. <laughs> yeah. Is there any consistent threads that you see in porn stars, mm -hmm. a person that chooses porn is their their path of livelihood not really like there's all sorts of people in it um i think my friends in particular are just really smart and savvy and thoughtful <laughs> um you know not you know they kind of really defy the stereotype of of maybe what some people think of you know what what type of person is like that gets into the sex industry i don't even know what the stereotype would be um you know like crazy drug addicts desperate certainly daddy issues daddy issues sure you might guess that's uh, with strippers yeah I don't, i'm about porn stars i don't i don't think i thought about this enough mm, i always thought it was kind of all encompassing that they all have that kind of stigma attached to them and that certainly exists i mean that you know it's, it's it's all sorts of people um yeah there's people that are annoying and people that are you know fucked up um but i feel pretty lucky my friends are really rad huh. yeah Interesting. What's this documentary movie that I'm working on? Yeah, uh, it's called "Use Me." Is the title, mm. and I've been working on it forever. But we finally finished it. It's a feature film slash like hybrid documentary. I think is the best way to describe it. So it it you watch it, and it feels like you're watching a documentary. I would compare it to. Did you ever see like I'm Still Here mm -mm. with Joaquin Phoenix? No. Did you see the movie Catfish? long time ago yeah kind of like that where it's like it's you're not really sure or like it feels like a documentary but you're not really sure what's what's real and what isn't cool. so there's a fictional storyline woven within it but it kind of plays on the theme of fantasy versus reality are there many porn star people that are entrepreneurial is I that think, like a standard i think now yeah um the internet has really changed things like it's you know, before you needed like a middleman, you know, you needed some guy with a camera and a company or whatever. Yeah, but right. now it's like, if you have an internet connection and a webcam, like you can do it yourself. And a lot of girls are like, and I see a lot of porn stars that would, you know, shoot for big companies like Vivid or Wicked or whatever um, coming into this because I think a lot of the mainstream porn um, there's not as much money in it because everything's so pirated. Oh, right. So really it's all about niche like yeah. kind of custom videos. Yeah, That's, that makes sense. Yeah, because you can't just go on Pornhub and, you know, find some video of me pretending to be your mom and, you know, crushing you with my, <laughs> the backs I've of my knees. I've been searching. I haven't I finally, <laughs> I found the, the mothership. Yes. <laughs> um, you're like a serious entrepreneur. Mm. It's pretty cool. Yeah, do Just all right. in the sense, in the sense of like financial whatever aside, like mm -hmm. you went, f you, that's like a joke. Like you figured out how to sell your piss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's fucking awesome <laughs> thank you <laughs> i like to think so <laughs> so what kind of lessons could people learn maybe like you know some 35 year old dude in minnesota's piss isn't as valuable as yours was when you were 17 or now yeah um but you can really like find a market or mm -hmm. for a lot anything i guess a lot of things yeah i mean i don't know i i feel that even though like I, I have put time into this and I've worked on it, I feel like a lot of it was luck too. Like I kind of came into this industry at the right time. Um, you but know, you had a sense, like you saw a thing. Yeah. Like I wouldn't really call it luck per se. Well, it's not all luck, but you know, I can't, you know, credit everything to me just, you know, working hard. Um you know, I mean, there's also things like the fact that, you know, I was born a woman. That was lucky. I was born in minutes. America, you know, right. like all sorts of things could have, you know, the dice could have been rolled different ways. Um, and then that I just kind of stumbled on it accidentally as well. 
I mean, I don't know how many people would have had the experience that I did of selling my piss and then thought like, oh, maybe there's more to it. Maybe a lot of people would just be like, well, that was weird. <laughs> and then yeah, go on right. with their life. I don't know. What mistakes have you made throughout the last 15 years of these mm-hmm. adventures? Mistakes. Let's see. Um, I probably was wasteful with my money a lot at first. What would you buy? Um, just crap I didn't need. I, like for a while I lived like in a really nice condo, um, which was pretty fun. Like uh, I liked living there, but when I bought my first house and then my second house, like the rent of that condo was more than both my mortgages combined. Yeah. You know? Are your places in Portland? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Sweet. So, but I mean, that's, I mean, you give some, you know, young person, you know, some 18 year old tons of money. They're probably not going to be very wise with it anyways. I mean, that's what you always hear about, you know, young athletes or what have you. They usually just blow it right away. So it certainly could have been worse, but I also could have been, probably been a bit smarter with it as well. What was the switch to actually making it rain? Um, to making it rain? <laughs> yeah, actually like making money that you were like 18 and like mm-hmm. whatever making it rain for an 18 year old is where you're like, whoa, I'm like really making some money right now. Uh-huh. How, what, did you have to set up a, a site? Did you have to have a membership program? Oh, like see. what was it actually like? Cause you gotta be able to put it together. Right. Well, I mean, you know, like I, you know, made money, like I said, on eBand and then I had my phone line. So it all kind of came together. I was like kind of lazy though at first. Like I was just kind of this pothead that like was making good enough money and it was easy. Um, but what really inspired me to make as much money as I could was that I had a friend who was also doing the same thing that I did. Um, just this girl I met that happened to live in the same town and we became friends. And, um, and she was, uh, or she is like 10 years older than me. And so she came into it like, fuck, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not 19. I'm, I gotta like work really hard at this while I can. Cause you know, my, my time's running up. Um, I didn't really understand at the time that that was her motivation. I just saw her working really hard and making way more money than I was. So Mm. I was jealous basically. And luckily that jealousy like fueled me to work harder. So pretty appreciative of that. Was there any major switches that happened for you to get more leverage? What do you mean leverage? The lever, like you were able to, you know, get more people on your site, or you were mm-hmm. able to like capture more, just whatever, get people to be paying you for your service. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a switch. It was just the big secret. Well, I don't know if it's a big secret, but to be successful at this is to always be making. Like, like I always put out three new videos a week. Right. And so you always have to be making content. You always have to be kind of making yourself available on phone, or you know, putting out auctions or whatever. And so as long as you're always putting something out, you're going to be on people's minds or, you know, people are going to be discovering you. And I've just had the luxury of time that I've been doing this long enough that yeah, that right. just built things from there and snowballed. What do you do with your time since you've probably, I've always found that to be a really interesting thing to maintain is, is just having time. Mm-hmm. Like I feel like a lot of us from, you know, whatever, 18 to whatever age you're like, working a nine to five job and mm-hmm. most of your day is devoted to somebody else's thing mm-hmm. and then you get back and you're tired and you just want to like drink a beer and watch sports or something yeah and then that was your day mm-hmm. you know so being able to s- somehow guard that time even if you're maybe making less money but you still have time to like read about the things you're interested in and connect mm-hmm. with the people that you find interesting yeah what were you doing with your time or were you busy making your videos um i was trying to like i kind of well, the thing about when you're young is, like, time seems a lot longer, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're just like, yeah, do that tomorrow, <laughs> you know? And then it's like the older you get, faster time goes. So I was kind of, like, noticing that. And that kind of created, like, a, a little mini panic and anxiety. And then the thought of, like, oh, shit, I can't do this forever. And so I became a little bit more obsessive about, you know, pouring more time into the business and, you know, trying to make as much money as I could. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where when you work for yourself, it is really easy to fuck off a lot. <laughs> yeah, <you know>? right. <laughs> what do your parents think about it? They're cool about it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. My dad thinks it's awesome. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. He thinks your dad has a sense of humor. Oh yeah. No, he thinks it's fantastic. He like brags all his friends and like, <laughs> you're really smart. It's cool. Yeah. Oh, it's hilarious. You. It's amazing. Yeah. My mom is a little like, we don't really talk about it very much. She's a little more reserved and she doesn't really like to talk about things that make her uncomfortable, but she doesn't seem to have a problem with it. How did you tell him? Um, well, it was, <laughs> I kind of had to tell him at some point because it was just obvious I wasn't, you know, 
because I don't know what I told him. I think I told him I was over at Starbucks or something. And it became really obvious that I wasn't, you know, buying new cars and a nice apartment, you know, with Starbucks money. Right. And so... Um, they think you were selling drugs? Well, I don't know. But, like, so my mom, like I said, she's a little more reserved. And so she would have just ignored it and, like, pretended like she didn't notice anything. And we could have just had that little, you know, relationship. Uh, but my dad is a little more, like, he doesn't not acknowledge the elephant in the room, even if he kind of just like makes jokes about it or something like that, you know? So he would always kind of make little comments here and there. And I could tell that he, um, he must've thought I was doing something worse than I was. So, you know, maybe drugs or maybe, you know, hooking on the side of the street or something like that. And so, um, so yeah, I felt like I should tell him to kind of alleviate, (laughs) you know, whatever, horror stories were going on in his head mm. so you know, yeah he was pretty relieved once i kind of broke it down for him and you know you have a boyfriend no how's your relationships they're fine it's this uh my job isn't an issue if that's what you mean like, yeah yeah i wonder how people would be like yeah it's 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 kind of a loophole in like the sex industry i feel like because again like i don't meet anyone i don't get naked i don't touch anyone yeah so it's pretty easy to separate and compartmentalize from just, I mean, based on the guys I've dated. So the only thing that m- was sort of an issue in like one relationship was that just the fact that I made a lot more money than he did. And so there was a little bit of feelings of inferiority. Yeah. Um, but the job itself was never an issue. Hmm. How's your relationships in general? Have you, what's been, have you had like long term relationships? Have you ever been like. My relationships tend to last like two years. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good. So longish. <laughs> what happens after two years? Um, I usually get bored or I feel stuck. I think that has a lot to do with like monogamy, though. Like I've I kind of found out like in my late twenties that monogamy just wasn't for me. So yeah. Um, and then right now it's like I like being single and I don't really feel like a a pining urge to like be in a relationship. So I don't date very often or anything like that. So I'm just pretty much content with you know, the way things are and, um, you know, whatever comes my way. Do you have a sensation of whether there's one more like natural approach to sexuality, like monogamy or polyamory or any of that stuff? Um, I don't know. I mean, everyone's different. I I think like really strict monogamy is, um, probably not the right way to go. Like, I think people generally like pair off, um, but I, I think it's very um, silly and short-sighted to uh, expect people to, you know, be completely monogamous just for the rest of their lives. You know, I, I think it's a mistake that people think that, you know, just because your partner cheats on you, then that has to be it. And, of course, it depends on what the situation is. But um, I think people jump to that a little too quickly and because uh, it's hard. Monogamy's hard, so. Yeah, wedding vows are so interesting. Mm. Till death do you part. Yeah. Like, I wonder how many people are reading them and they're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you just, you just kind of say it. Just. Yeah. Yeah, it's intense. I mean, it's, it's also, you know, very romantic sounding. Um, yeah, I guess I could see myself getting enamored by that now that I think about it. Yeah. It sounds romantic. Yeah. It's idealistic and, hey, if you can do it, that's awesome. But I don't necessarily think that just because a relationship ends before you die that it was a failure. Do you want to get married? Mm, I don't think so. It's not a goal. <laughs> well, I mean, some people have that. They're just like, these are the milestones I want to hit in life. And so, no, it's not like, it's not something I'm like, uh, you know, I definitely want to do. But maybe if I meet the right person. What's, is there any like, what are, I guess the movie would be the the next project you're most excited about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about it. Is there, what's, what's beyond that? What's beyond that? I don't know. Um, well, like I said, I have a podcast. I'm pretty excited about oh, yeah, that. Right. What's the podcast called? It's called Standard Deviation. Oh, what's it all about? So it's me and my roommate, and we started like in May or June or something like that. So pretty new, less than a year. And f- up until now, it's mostly just been me and him talking, just about whatever, politics, current events, whatever's on our mind, drugs, anything. Do you think you have crossover from people that are doing the membership stuff i know that there is it's not i don't like actively advertise my podcast on my you know cr lynch twitter or whatever but um 
I also don't like necessarily try to keep it a secret because that would be, yeah, right. you know, it's the internet. The that'd to, be, yeah. well, that'd be just, you know, you couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do know that there are um, a few guys that have kind of figured it out and, and listened. And so that's pretty cool because um, I think they are genuinely curious about, you know, just me as a person and what I think about and stuff like that. Yeah, right. I imagine most of my audience would just be like, what the fuck is this? I can't jerk off to it. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> because <laughs> men that jerk off that's pretty much all they do yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> if you're a man that jerks off every now and again yeah that's your life <laughs> you have no interest beyond <laughs> slapping well, your stuff around know, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> well it's more like probably most guys just kind of see me as like a one dimensional <laughs> thing and that's what they want to see me as you know oh yeah right good point um, <laughs> <laughs> But um, but yeah, I'm excited about that. And up until now, it's just kind of been me and my roommate talking. But this trip uh, to LA, we've been making some connections and getting some interviews. So we're cool. pretty excited about that to have more guests on. And yeah, I love it. I've I really like podcasts. Like I've always been a pretty big fan. Like I listen to them all the time. And so I just love the idea of having an excuse to talk to interesting people. It's best. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, I, I guess you can kind of do it otherwise, but podcasting is just it's such a good excuse to just sit down and that's what people go deep. need yeah, yeah it's like having we always have this objective of like doing something especially live in like los angeles or something mm-hmm. where it's like what are we doing yeah so it's really cool to have the container of you know how, whatever the duration is where it's like oh we're just gonna talk and yeah sit and do the thing and also have like an intentional conversation which is another thing that i think is yeah that's a, a good really word for thing. it intentional conversation yeah so what would the, what would yours what's your podcast about? Um, what's your elevator pitch? <laughs> our elevator pitch. Uh, we try to. Um, well, it's kind of in the name, so standard deviation. So we're trying to be like talk about things that um, uh, most people don't want to talk about. We try to get oh, get in taboos, and we try to be vulnerable, and um, you know, talk about like maybe opinions we have that you know would be a little too nervous to bring up at a Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I guess that's the best way. It's, it is a pretty general, though. It's just kind of whatever comes up. Does anything come to mind? What? Opinion that would be awkward to bring up at Thanksgiving? Mm, well, let's see. So I live in Portland, and it's very progressive, and I'm a liberal, um, but I... I'm a cuck, so... Oh, there you go. All right. Totally totally <laughs> a couple good. of cucks over here. Yeah. Um, but I think um, there's this fringe in the left that's kind of going a little crazy right now. Um, and it's it's particularly apparent, like, in, in Portland with, like, Antifa protests and stuff like that. But it's hard to kind of bring those things up because, um, you know, those... It's, those are the anti-fascists, you know? They're supposed to be the good guys. Um, mm. So to criticize that you know maybe it's not a good idea to show up at a protest and just spit on people or yell at them or whatever mm. um it's hard to make that argument without making it sound like you're some you're, you're just some alt-right nazi or whatever you're like you're on the other side um yeah i don't know i just feel like it's really hard to bring nuance to like political conversations without people just getting really emotional and angry um and it's a shame because i I'm really curious about these sorts of things. Like I, I like to look at things just really rationally and um, you know, it's, I think it's important to just look at ideas and consider them. It doesn't mean you have to actually hold on to them and, and right. say like, you know, this is my opinion, but to, you know, um, just understand how people think, even if it's um, horribly offensive or, or whatever, because you can't change something without understanding it. Ideas can be like dance partners, I think. Yeah? Yeah. What does that mean? So if you go, so I'm into like dance events of whatever sort, you know, and so it's within that you can kind of go and you can play and dance with a different person and they have like a different style mm-hmm. and you'll like, you'll learn from that mm. and you'll be like, cool, so we're going to do this and then you'll do it for, you know, whatever, like you said, like the two-year relationship point or whatever, you do that point where it's like, cool, like. Yeah. I think I got it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then you can go play with somebody else, but you're not mm-hmm. like, okay, we've danced together. Now we just have to like osmosis, like merge skin. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It's okay to like pick ideas up. Like I'll try to do that. Like last night, 
um, before I was watching your humiliation videos. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was watching, my night was very interesting. I went from like writing, um, doing this in this, uh, writing a book right now. So I was like, went from like researching like you know, effects of walking on your whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that to Marilyn Manson interviews mm. to like, uh, prison fights and like courtroom people that are going to it's very interesting that we can see people that are like about to be sent to death row or whatever mm-hmm. it's just a fascinating thing to be like oh here I am like sitting in my apartment in Santa Monica yeah and that's just another person living their life through different eyes I think mm-hmm. you know like I the fact that I'm here where I'm at I don't think is I think I'm, I'm just a product of my environment like I don't really mm-hmm. take I don't think that I created anything. I think I just kind of played my cards the way that they they mm-hmm. were they were handed to me. Mm-hmm. And so when you see somebody like a Marilyn Manson, I wonder just like how did he come into being Marilyn Manson? Yeah, you know. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. He's very fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> his his interviews. He's like he's, he's a smart guy. Yeah, he's also pretty much completely insane. I think probably from what I saw. How recent was the interview that you watched? This one was pretty recent, I mm-hmm. think. So he was older. Okay. Because I, yeah, where did I, oh, I heard his interview on Marin, I think. I don't know. But he sounded like he was maybe drunk or high or something and a little out of it. Yeah. Um, but I remember some of his interviews in the 90s. He seemed really, like, just sharp. Mm. Like, I remember when the whole Columbine shooting happened. Yeah. And people were blaming Marilyn Manson <laughs> for it, which sounds so silly now. Um, oh, no. I said Marilyn Manson, not Marilyn Manson. What did you say? Um, I didn't mean Charles Mar- Manson? Charles Manson. Ah, okay. Marilyn Manson, super smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Charles Manson. Smart. Charles insane. Manson, completely insane. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, that's So that was, I was watching dark, dark stuff. I yeah, wouldn't yeah. consider Marilyn Manson to be dark. Okay. Yeah, he's like faux dark. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, watch how dark I can be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm, the yeah. other Manson. Maybe you did say Charles Manson. I don't know. Sure. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Matter. That's funny. Actually, that's interesting, too, because I was watching interviews of Ted Budney the other Good. Day. Yeah. <laughs> we were probably at the same time. <laughs> Maybe. The universe. Yeah. yeah it's I, so interesting. Mm-hmm. Especially Ted Bundy, because I just remembered, I don't know what how this thought came into my head, but I remembered that... Ted Bundy was supposedly very charming and mm. like a, like kind of a, like a like ladies man like women lo- like even when he was arrested and put in prison like all these women were sending him love letters and shit. Oh wow! So I was just curious. I was like, well, how what is, what's his deal? And so I started like looking up YouTube videos of interviews with him, and uh, there were some crazy ones where he was being held, but they weren't sure if he had done these murders or not. Like he hadn't, it hadn't been proven yet, and uh, you just listened to him pleading his case and very convincing like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, a one i saw i've i've watched probably lots of hours like more hours than i need to i'm, I'm sure i've like scarred my <laughs> my emotional <laughs> something by now but um there was a woman where she had murdered her children and she was like um they, they were they were asking her about it and she was like denying it and then afterwards it's just like crying and then afterwards she started laughing mm. it's just the most demented shit yeah but so my so my interest in watching that stuff is just is just i'm i think we're all just like these books and we're kind of writing our chapters each day and so when you see someone that's at that point where you're like yeah i've like eat people and have them in my fridge yeah like that started off as just this this precious little baby yeah you know that like wild. fell over and skinned his knees and mm, you know, know like lollipops so do you think that's a- <laughs> <laughs> whatever <laughs> Do you think that's an innate? Uh, I don't know. Um, what do you think? I think it probably is. I think psychopathy is like that's a real thing. It's like they've done like brain scans of psychopaths, and you know the part of your brain that feels empathy and stuff is pretty much dead in their brain. So, but it's always to me, it's always like a nature versus nurture thing. Yeah, you know, because because you you can see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the expression of where the person's at. So you can see that, but they also like got themselves there. Yeah. So what did it look like in the in the beginning? Uh huh. I don't know. Yeah. It's just interesting. No, I think it even if is we, a little both. Even if we think we have an answer, it doesn't mean it is the answer. Yeah, that's like, true. Like we have the new science, whatever. It's like, great, well, that could change in like six months. Yeah, and there's so many variables. Um yeah, not all psychopaths end up killing people too. Mm. Uh. Yeah. 
Some of them just, you know, end up on Wall Street or whatever. <laughs> oh, right, good point. Or president. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nothing in relation to any president per- specifically. Yeah. But, you just, know. Just all the presidents. You can arrive there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> presidents. <laughs> in general. That's cool. Okay. All right. Well, sweet. What's, um, we should wrap this, wrap this, this, this puppy up. We're like okay. 40, 40 odd, almost coming up on the, right on the on. time frame. Um, Man, oh man, I'm like so excited that you exist. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's it's fucking ex- inspiring. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a fun life I got. Oh, uh, I'm really excited to see what's next. Yeah, me too. I'd be very very curious. <laughs> yeah. Do well, you we'll feel Do you feel proud of your work? Yeah, yeah, I do. Cool. Yeah, I feel proud, but I I think I'm more I feel more grateful. Because mm. again, it goes back to like. A lot of a lot of it was beyond my control. A lot of it was a lot of luck that kind of came together. Um, so it's I am proud, but I think I'm mostly grateful because you know I could have been some you know poor child dying of AIDS in Africa. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, there's a lot of options. Yeah, so. you could be Charles Manson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So people should uh, tune into the podcast, I guess. Where, yes, where, where should people go? I wonder what percentage of people listening to this would become subscribers for the humiliatrix stuff. I don't know. It's very fascinating. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should have had like a you know like a code. We should do it a line code. Yeah. <laughs> humiliatrix a line code. <laughs> that would be unprecedented <laughs> <laughs> like podcast. Uh, um yeah you can find my <laughs> podcast at standardpodcast.com cool. and you know look standard deviation up on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts it's probably there. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, any send off words of whatever to people or just go check out the podcast and Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not a good finisher. No, that's good. No, we're finished up. All right. Um well sweet. Thanks so much for coming out and yeah. getting in the freezer. Totally. Sitting on the biomat. Yeah. I did all the, the things. Sauna. Playing your steel drum. Played that's the not... steel drum. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank yeah. you so much, Sierra. You're welcome. Over now. Pow. Hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Sierra Lynch, the humiliatrix. Uh, Really fun. Very interesting. It just goes to show that there are a whole slew of different potential occupations that one could take on. Uh, It's very big, wide, open world out there for us, especially during these interesting times. Uh, if you did find this interesting, you're welcome to share it. I'd really appreciate that, actually. You could share it on the Instagram. is a logical place. You could tell your friends, what have you. If you do share it on the gram, you could share it with Align Podcast and uh, or tag Align Podcast and also tag Sierra Lynch, C-E-A-R-A-L-Y-N-C-H. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. I hope you are doing something good for yourself today. I hope you are paying attention to your breath. I hope you're paying attention to the way you're using your eyes. Right now, maybe take a moment and allow your vision to space out a little bit. Allow yourself to take in the whole entire room. You've probably been focusing on your cell phone, focusing on your screen, something of the sort. Maybe take a moment right now. Let your eyes relax. Uh, focus on a little exhalation and just take a chill. Really great for your nervous system, really great for your hormones, really great for your overall sense of well-being. When you breathe out, exhalation calms your nervous system. When you relax your eyes, that also calms your nervous system. If you're feeling stressed, that's a great tool. Uh, If you want to learn more tools like that, you can check out the Align Method online program. Six weeks, we break it down into really simplistic terms. Everything that you need to know on how to drive your body effectively. Lots of tips, tricks, hacks, things of the sort on how to make your body feel calm, make your body feel excited, uh, make your body feel focused, uh, and get rid of some of those aches and pains that you may have. That can be found at alignpodcast.com. You can also go to my the link for it in my bio on Instagram at Align Podcast. I hope you guys are good. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for joining you. I'll see you next week. Bye.